front of you guys. Um, my last sermon was if, uh, was last year, but that was online. So I um, but the so the atmosphere right now is different. Um, I remember I spoke in my first sermon when I was in the third grade. Uh, that was a while back ago, but I'm very thankful and grateful to God for giving me this opportunity to speak his word in front of you guys again. Um, but before we begin, uh, shall we bow our heads in a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we come before your heavenly throne with humble hearts, Lord, um, as we um, are now ready to receive um, the message you have in store for us, Lord. Um, may the words that come out of my mouth be in, in accordance to thy will, Lord. Hide me behind the cross, Lord, so that um, whatever I speak um, will not be directly from me, but be directly from you, Lord. Uh, may the values and um, the message that um, is shared today resonate within our hearts, Lord, so that we may apply it to our daily Christian living, Lord. Forgive us from the sins, from the sins we have committed against thee. Let us be worthy to your sight. In your loving name we pray. Amen. All right, so um, as you can see, the title of um, my of the sermon for today is called "The Good Ending" and the failures that preceded. Um, as you can see, um, there's a film reel um, as uh, El Elder uh, Ruben uh, mentioned. Uh, I want to. Uh, I'm aiming to become a filmmaker as a career in the future. Um, so uh, let me introduce myself a bit. Um, I haven't really been open <laughs> about my hobbies, about my interests with here, because um, I'm always at the sidelines. And uh, uh, most of the people who speak are either my mom or my dad. So uh, let me introduce myself again. Um, my name is Jed Solano. Oh. Right. Uh, and. Um, Ever since I was little, I was always fascinated with storytelling, the, the concept of um, creating worlds or um, adapting worlds um, and adding your values, adding lessons to it and touching people's hearts with simple stories. That always um, intrigued me. And that's what I wanted to do with my life. I established that since I was a kid, I always told myself, when you grow up, you're going to be a storyteller in um, any shape or form. And um, the form that I was always interested in was movies um, as a medium of storytelling. Um, I remember uh, most of my childhood, I remember sitting next to my dad on my couch um, in front of the TV as we went through our DVD collection. And um, yeah. Um, I wanted to become a filmmaker since I was a kid. Oh. Uh, so, uh, yep, that's me. Uh, I was in the third grade in this picture with me with a clapperboard. And I remember um, I, I drew this picture uh, when I was in the fourth grade. Yeah, it says <laughs> light, camera, action. When I grow up, I want to be a director because I want to use my imagination. It seems fun. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and it's. It's funny because I come from a family of educators. Um, um, my mom's a teacher. Um, my dad uh, was a teacher. Um, my aunts and uncles are teachers, professors. Um, I have a cousin who's a teacher, and I have other cousins who are stu currently studying to become teachers. And some are um, in the medical field as well. So um, it must be pretty shocking <laughs> uh, for my mom when she heard that I wanted to go into the film industry, because that's such a huge 180 from education. But uh, regardless, um, they were very supportive. And um, I remember my mom telling me, uh, if it's God's will, it's God's will. Um, maybe God uh, gave you this passion for cinema uh, and filmmaking uh, for a purpose. And maybe you'll do great things with um, the gift and drive that he has given you. And I thank my parents for being supportive about that. I remember my um, my dad was on the phone with my grandma and um, uh, and my grandma was asking my dad, hey, wh what's Jed studying again? 
and my dad was uh, like, oh yeah, he's studying um, uh, video and film production. And she was like, really? I thought it was just a phase. <laughs> I expect him to grow out of it, but uh, here I am, uh, still uh, wanting to become a filmmaker. Um, uh, and speaking of movies, um, I'm not an athletic type. I'm not an athletic type, uh, but uh, one genre that I enjoy watching are sport films. Um, it's a great genre that the whole family can watch. It's family friendly, and it's so inspiring and motivating because um, it's packed with good values and good lessons that you can learn from. And uh, watching like you know the underdogs defy the impossible, watching the weak team uh, secure the win with one more second left on the scoreboard, and uh, securing that victory, or watching a devoted athlete train their heart out and reaping the rewards um, that the, uh, through the hard work that they put in. It's very thrilling. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you recognize these movies. Uh, Facing the Giants, um, that's a Christian film. Uh, and The Blind Side, um, it's not specifically a Christian film, but um, it's an inspiring film. Um, and as you notice, uh, one thing in common these two movies have are uh, they involve uh, American football. Uh, or NF or the NFL, uh, National Football League, and um, I was reading a book by Max Lucado uh, called Glory Days that mentioned a specific football game and player, and um, I found it intriguing, and I, and I want to share with share it with you uh, this Sabbath. Um, so uh, this is a true story, uh, and. In the 1991 Super Bowl, a team from Buffalo, it's a city in America, uh, a team from Buffalo known as the Buffalo Bills were going against the New York Giants, which is a huge team. This was a big deal. The New York Giants are regarded as one of the greats, and now this uh, small team from Buffalo uh, are facing them. So the city of Buffalo hadn't won a major sports championship since 1965. This was 1991. And this time, 1991, uh, it seemed like they were going to win this time. Um, with seconds to go, they were just one point down from victory. Um, they reached the Giants' 29-yard uh, line. So there was time for only one more play. So uh, the Buffalo Bills turned to their kicker, Scott Norwood, this guy right here. Um, and uh, they looked at him as the final hope uh, for them to win against the New York Giants. If he won, this was going to be their first victory in a long time. Um, so Scott Norwood, he's all pro, and he's the leading scorer of their team. Uh, one season, he made 32 out of 37 attempts. That is very accurate. He's such an accurate kicker. He's good at what he does. He had scored from... Um, this distance, uh, the 29-yard line, five times during the season. He just needed to do it a sixth time. He just needed to uh, kick, make a good goal successfully one more time. He was their only hope. So, it was such a huge deal. So, the entirety of the United States of America watched as Scott Norwood went through his pre-kick routine. Just one successful kick and he'll bring the win back to his city and he'll give um, the city its first major sports championship win in 26 years. That's a lot of pressure. So Scott tuned down the crowd. Imagine this like a sports movie, right? He tuned down the crowd. He selected the target line. He got a feel for the timing. He felt the grass. He felt the atmosphere. With just one more kick, and he's going to secure the victory and represent and give... Um, and put Buffalo on the map as one of the greats of this Super Bowl event. He tuned out the atmosphere, he waited for the snap, and he kicked the ball. He kept his head down and followed through, but by the time he looked up, the ball was three quarters of the way to the goal. That's when he realized he missed. Mm, oof. Um, um, the New Yorkers watching all cheered, and the whole city of Buffalo groaned and booed. It was awful. 
so close to victory, but he just missed. He failed. Newspapers and articles would headline the front page with his name for the wrong reasons. So, um, yeah, they were, uh, the newspaper companies were milking out of this um, story. Um, there was one headline that specifically said, Wide and to the right, the kick that will forever haunt Scott Norwood. There's nothing Scott could do. He couldn't um, turn back time and redo the kick. He couldn't wa rewatch the tapes. There's no second chance. There's no do-overs. He had his chance and he missed. He failed. This is not one of his better days. Uh, so um, let's go way back in time and look at a similar story in the Bible. Um, if you have your Bibles uh, with you, um, I would like you to open to Joshua chapter 7. Um, if you don't have your Bibles with you, um, that's all right, because um, I will be um, putting up the verses on the slides. But um, whichever Bible version you're comfortable with, please open up, and we could read along. That's uh, Joshua chapter 7. All right, uh, verse 1. It says, but the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. So uh, right off the bat, um, we're already into some negatives. Uh, so uh, God instructed um, the Israelites not to take um, anything, uh, any of the devoted things um, that um, they took from uh, um, Jericho. But um, this guy, um, Achan, uh, sinned. All right, verses 2 to 5. Uh, Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Bethaven, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land. And the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not have all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. So, um, to put context, um, so the Israelites um, just got out of Jericho, and their next city that's on their path to the promised land is Ai. And um, so Joshua did his thing as a leader. Um, we all know that um, he, he, his background is military. So he sent in some spies, and his spies advised him to not bring everyone up because um, the city of Ai is weak. There are just few of them. This is an easy win. We can just pass through them and uh, go safely without a hassle. This will be fine. Let's see what happens next. Um, so about 3,000 men went up there from the people, and they fled before the men of Ai. The men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. What a humiliating defeat. The city of Ai just consisted of few people, yet the thousands of soldiers that Joshua sent were defeated. <laughs> And now Joshua has the task to call out one of his men, um, Achan, for his sins. He had to um, um, punish the Israelites for it. And that's such an awful feeling as a leader. Um, so um, if we jump to uh, verse 7, um, and Joshua said, Alas, O Lord, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? With that, we had been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. Wow. Joshua has been making field goals, field goals all his life. He was like Scott. He, um, he made it all the way out of Egypt with Moses. They made it through the Red Sea. Um, they made it through the wilderness. They made it through Jericho, a walled city that's heavily structured and heavily guarded and they passed through it. But this little city, consisting of just a few people, defeated them. How embarrassing. He failed. 
He failed in front of his army. He failed in front of the enemy. He failed in front of his people. And he failed in front of God. Put yourself into Joshua's shoes for a minute. Imagine walking out of that tent after hearing the news. And you hear families of your people mourning the 36 lives that were lost. Imagine how the people looked at Joshua. They probably glared and stared at him. They probably murmured and whispered words of self-doubt. They probably went, Joshua's not a good leader. He took us all the way here and we lost to this small city. And Joshua probably listened and probably fed into that self-doubt. He probably thought, man, why did I take this job? I don't deserve this position. I failed my people. Imagine the guilt he felt. We probably had these moments too where we failed. Maybe we lost a job. Maybe we failed a test. Maybe our relationships fell apart. Maybe our businesses uh, didn't work out. Maybe we lost money. Maybe we made accidents and mistakes. And sometimes we fed into the voices, the self-doubt, like, um, like monkeys in a cage taunting you. Sometimes we agreed with them. Sometimes we even joined them. But the thing is, failure finds us all. You know, it's interesting how uh, no self-help uh, teachers address it. You know, um, I've read through many self-help books, and my friends did too. I remember uh, one of my friends complaining to me, um, man, this self-help books that I got, um, it, it was a book titled uh, How to Be Happy or something along those lines. And he's like, I read the first chapter, and I didn't feel happy. He put the book down, and it didn't work out for him. Um, because, um, self-help books don't address that. Um, you could see a self-help book that says, uh, how to succeed, but you won't see one that says how to succeed at failing because failure is so universal. Uh, everyone fails. It's such a common thing, yet we don't address it and we don't accept it as well and take it in. Um, but no matter how many self-help books or self-help courses or instructors uh, we have, the best self-help instructor is God. And the best self-help book is the Bible. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Because the Bible addresses failure. The Bible is somewhat written for failure. It's full of flops and full of um, loss and full of um, defeat. David was a moral failure, yet God used him. Elijah was an emotional train wreck after Mount Carmel, but God still blessed him. Jonah was a coward. He ran away and ended up at the belly of a fish, yet God still saved him. These Bible characters, they're not perfect, but they sure were perfect messes. But um, regardless, God used them. Why? Because God uses failures. That's the universal truth. We're all failures. None of us are perfect, but God still used us. At that moment, God used Joshua's failure to show us what to do with ours. So when Joshua cried out in frustration and shame, God urged Joshua to get on with life. Um, if we jump to Joshua chapter 7, verse 10, um, it says, The Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Joshua was depressed. He, he was devastated. Um, it's such a crushing defeat. He, he was on the floor. He was crying. He was an emotional train wreck. But God just spoke to him and said, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Get up, buddy. Come on. One stumble doesn't define or break a person. Even though you failed, God's love does not. You have to face your failures in God's goodness. God sees everything. He, he saw this collapse coming. Um, God sees the big picture and everything in our whole lives, in the entire history of the world. 
He knows it and he has it etched out and planned. When we stood on, our, on the eastern side of Jordan, God saw our eye coming. When we feel good, when we are in our highest, God already knows um, the lowest that's about to come. But it's nothing to him. Yet God tells Joshua to arise. Um, if we move um, another chapter, Joshua chapter 8, verses 1 to 2. It says, And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear and do not be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you and arise. Go up to Ai. See, I have given into your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city, and his land. There's no fine print here. Uh, there's no condition in the covenant. There's no loophole. Remember this. Once God promises something, it will happen. He will fulfill that promise. And brothers and sisters in Christ, um, the Bible is filled with promises. And uh, we have a God that will fulfill each and every one of them. God's promised land that he's offering to us does not depend on our, perf on our perfection. It depends on his. And he is perfect. That's a guarantee. In God's hands, no defeat is a crushing defeat. Um, it says here in Psalm 37, verses 23 to 24, the steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong, for the Lord upholds his hand. Though he fall, he shall not be cast headlong. Failure is not fatal. Failure is not forever. It's not the end. Um, and we have a God that doesn't want us to fail. We have a God that wants us to succeed. And he's going to do everything in his power to make it right with you. Um, another verse that I like is in Romans chapter 8. Sorry if we're um, jumping between uh, books. But yes, uh, Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 1 and verse 4. It says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Everyone stumbles. The only difference is in the response that we have. Others, when they fail, they get swallowed by shame. They, they, they fall into the pit of guilt and they let that guilt consume them and they beat themselves up for it, for failing. But um, others tumble into the arms of Jesus. And that's what we should do whenever we fall. We should tumble into the arms of God. God told Joshua, arise and go. Um, yeah. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear and do not be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you and arise. Go up to I. God was essential, essentially telling Joshua that defeat you just faced, that's nothing. It's all right. Get up. You're good to go. I am with you. I promise you this land, and I'm going to give it to you. Just get up, take up all the fighting men, and arise. Go up to I. Um, we all know the story of the prodigal son. Um, he left... Um, his father and spent all his inheritance, spent all his money on um, all this uh, worldly things uh, just to feel pleasure, just to feel euphoria. And when he ran out of money, he ended up in a pig pen. And I, I want to uh, contextualize this. Imagine uh, putting on um, the prodigal son's shoes. Imagine feeling that. Imagine being in a pig pen, in a dirty old farm, 
starving, penniless, ashamed. You've just fell off, you have nothing, and you're just surrounded by um, these um, dirty um, swine, and um, you're starving, and, um, and all you could do is um, just take bites of um, the swine uh, food and uh, dirt that they're eating. Imagine how deprecating and degrading that is. Yet, um, the prodigal son stepped outside, thought for a moment, and thought, what am I doing? Why am I here? In Luke chapter 15, verse 18, um, he goes, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Just like um, Joshua, he simply went, I will arise and go. And we can do that. We can do that. We can arise as well. Um, we can't undo the damage. Um, when we failed, it still failed. It's etched in stone. But what we can do is arise and go to our Father. Landing in a pig pen isn't good. It stinks. But staying in that pig pen and not going anywhere else after is just unwise. We have to rise up and step out. There's another verse um, I like. Uh, it's found in Philippians uh, chapter 3, verses 13 to 14. It says, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Forget the past. Leave that behind. Go forward. The only way forward is up. If you've hit rock bottom, the only way up is going forward. That's the only direction you have. That's the only option you have right now. So God told Joshua to arise and go. Make a move. It's as if God is saying, let's do it again. But this time, my way. So, back to the story, back to Joshua and I. Um, if you'd like to go back to uh, Joshua chapter 8, verses um, 3, we're starting from verse 3. It says, So Joshua and all the fighting men arose to go up to Ai. And Joshua chose 30,000 mighty men of valor and sent them out by night, and he commanded them, Behold, you shall lie in ambush against the city behind it. Do not go very far from the city, but all of you remain ready, and I and all the people who are with me will approach the city. And when they come out after us, until we have drawn them away from the city, for they will say, they are fleeing from us just as before them. So we will flee before them. Then you shall rise up from the ambush and seize the city. For the Lord your God will give it into your hand. And as soon as you have taken the city, you shall set the city on fire. You shall do according to the word of the Lord. See, I have commanded you. Next verses, 10 to 13. Joshua arose early in the morning and mustered the people and went up. He and the elders of Israel before the people to Ai and all the fighting men who were with him went up and drew near before the city and encamped on the north side of Ai with a ravine between them and Ai. He took about 5,000 men and set them in ambush between Bethel and Ai to the west of the city. So they stationed the forces, the main encampment that was north of the city and its rear guard west of the city. But Joshua spent that night in the valley. Last one. And as soon as the king of Ai saw this, he and all his people, the men of the city, hurried and went out early to the appointed place toward the Arabah to meet Israel in battle. But he did not know that there was an ambush against him behind the city. And Joshua and all Israel pretended to be beaten before them and fled in the direction to the wilderness. So all the people who were in the city were called together to pursue them. And as they pursued Joshua, they were drawn away from the city. Not a man was left in Ai or Bethel who did not go out after Israel. 
They left the city open and pursued Israel. Last one. Then the Lord said to Joshua, stretch out the javelin that is in your hand toward I, for I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out the javelin that was in his hand toward the city. And the men in the ambush rose quickly out of their place. And as soon as he stretched out his hand, they ran and entered the city and captured it. And they hurried to set the city on fire. So when the men of Ai looked back, behold, the smoke of the city went up to heaven. And they had no power to flee this way or that for the people who fled to the wilderness turned back against the pursuers. And when Joshua and all Israel saw that the ambush had captured the city and that the smoke of the city went up, then they turned back against and struck down the men of Ai. And the others came out from the city against them. So they were in the midst of Israel, some on this side and some on that side. And Israel struck them down until there was left none that survived and escaped. Do you notice the difference between um, Joshua's first attack and the second attack? Um, the first, um, first verses we read, right, that um, of the first attack, um, it was just covered by one paragraph. It was so short and it was so simple. While this second attack, that was, we just read a lot of that, right? I was basically reading out um, battle strategy. strategy. Um, the first attack um, that Joshua and his men did in I included no tactics. It was reckless. It was simple. But the second time, it was more strategic, more sophisticated. They were using military tactics. They were hiding out. They, they were surrounding the city. It was clever. It was smart. They tricked the, um, they tricked the enemy. The people of Ai were um, so satisfied from their first victory. They were strutting around. So when they saw that the Israelites were coming for the second time, they were like, that's fine. We beat them the first time. We'll, we'll chill. We'll just chase them out. But of course, it was a trap. Um, and in the first um, attack, all Joshua did was consulted spies. He just sent out spies, and they came back, and they gave him advice. And the second time, Joshua listened to God. And the first time, he stayed back at camp. And the second time, Joshua went out there himself, and he led the way. He brought the entire camp with him. There were more people. There was more strategy. It was 10 times better than the initial attack. And they got their victory. God gave Joshua a new plan. And Joshua used God's strategy. And the victory was his. If we use God's strategy, the victory is yours. Amen? Amen. Um, uh, another biblical character also experienced um, the beauty and the blessing of God's second chance. Um, uh, Simon Peter was a fisherman. That was his career. Um, all his life, he was trained as a boy to go out in the Sea of Galilee to um, cast out his nets and fish. That was his career. That was what put money in, that, that, that's what put food on the table and money in his pockets. That was his entire life. Simon was a fisherman. But one night, he went out in the Sea of Galilee and caught nothing, absolutely nothing, zero, zero fishes, worth nothing at all. He failed. It's his entire career, but he got nothing. He's all um, the training, all he did, and yet nothing. But luckily, the next day, um, Jesus was using his boat as a platform in the public, preaching words of encouragement. And after Jesus' sermon, he took Simon Peter aside and asked him to let down uh, his nets. And as we see here in Luke chapter 5, verse 5, and Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. I, I like this picture that I chose because um, you could see that um, there's an audience watching 
um, from uh, the sermon G Jesus was having. So uh, once again, I'd like to um, contextualize this, and I want you guys to uh, put on Peter's, uh, Simon Peter's shoes for a bit. You just failed. You're, you are an expert at your occupation. Uh, you are a master at fishing. Last night, you failed. And um, this guy comes up to you, who's not a fisherman, but a carpenter, such a huge 180 in career, and he's telling you how to fish. Right now, near the shore, and there's an audience watching all of this. Imagine the pressure, imagine the fear. Yet, Simon answered, at your word, I will let down the nets. And what happened? Tons of fish came into the nets and were caught. Tons of fish, so much fish that the boat nearly sank with, due to how heavy um, the fishes were. Sometimes all we need to do is try again, but with Christ in the boat. Yeah. Um, uh, Max Lucado, uh, a famous Christian author, uh, once said, failures are fatal if we fail to learn from them. And that's what we should do. Um, we should learn from our failures or else it's useless. Um, as I said, uh, I wanted to be a filmmaker. Uh, I was so excited. I felt like that I was born to be one. I, I was so passionate about it. Uh, in high school, I, w I spent most of my time building up my portfolio. Uh, whenever there was a class project, I would volunteer to make uh, student films or uh, edit for um, some uh, organizations. Uh, the electives I took, they were all related to film. I took animation, I took uh, creative writing, I took journalism, I took drama. I was building, I was so, I was preparing myself to be uh, this uh, filmmaker so that when I graduated, I'll go into this university and everything. I even, uh, yeah, I, as uh, uh, Elder Rubin says, yeah, I, I volunteered uh, to write the scripts for, um, uh, our school's Journey to Bethlehem program, which is a, a basically a bunch of Christmas plays stitched together room by room, and I was proud of that. Um, I was ready. I was so ready. I was in contact with my guidance counselor. We were going back and forth, uh, deciding to choose which university was right for me that would help me um, build steps uh, uh, so that I may be paved into this career. And then uh, I found CIIT, which was located in Quezon City, Manila. Uh, it was perfect. I, uh, it had my exact course that I wanted. I saw uh, the rubric. I saw every course that's planned out for uh, those four years, and I was ready. I was so excited. I remember um, telling my parents about it, and uh, it was perfect. So I graduated. Uh, from Trinity, and I got in CIIT. I passed the entrance exam and I got in. Classes were online, so I got to stay uh, with my parents. But uh, then I started to struggle. Uh, I noticed that uh, during uh, lectures, which were online, uh, I started uh, having trouble concentrating and focusing on what's being said. I started to struggle um, doing the assignments, keeping up with the deadlines, uh, working with my fellow peers. I started getting panic attacks. Uh, at random moments during the day, during class, before class, after class, sometimes uh, during class my heart would palpitate. I would uh, feel it's as if my heart was bursting out of my chest. Um, uh, a bunch of voices were in my head and I couldn't focus and I was uh, nervous and I was pumped with so much anxiety. Um, sometimes uh, I even burst out crying and I was having nervous breakdowns every day. Um, 
like so, uh, I had one nervous breakdown that was so bad uh, I disassociated from my body. It was awful, and I was struggling, and I was not having a good time. I was uh, failing assignments. I was missing classes, and uh, I went into contact with my uh, guidance counselor again, and we took a, a screening test to diagnose me, and uh, it turns out uh, I had generalized anxiety disorder. I thought I could cope, but I failed, and I thought it was the end of the world. All of this hard work, I was so excited. I thought I was on the right track. I thought I could do it, yet I was struggling, and I was failing, and I was dwindling outside of that road that I thought I was walking through. I was angry. I, I was scared. I, I was um, shaming myself. I was beating myself up mentally and sometimes even physically. Um, yeah, all this pressure, all the people that were cheering me on, all the people who were expecting me to succeed, people who thought that I was um, all right, I was disappointing them. I felt like I was disappointing them and I was failing them. I felt like an absolute failure. I failed five courses. And um, I, remember, I, I remember being so hopeless. Uh, one night, I felt so dev devastated. I was listening to those um, negative voices, and I was ready to give up. I was done. I was, I was unconsolable. I was crying. I was a mess. Little thoughts went into my head. But thank God the Holy Spirit intervened and consoled me. I fell on my knees and cried to God, just like Joshua, just like, just like Joshua after his defeat in Ai, just, just like um, David in mourning, just like Jonah in the belly of the whale. I was on my knees crying to God, why? And what is your purpose in me? Why am I in such a low point in my life? I was so caught up wanting to be a director, wanting to direct my entire life that I forgot that God was the true director. I forgot that God was in control. But I got up and I arose and went to God. The next morning um, after that night, uh, I told my parents and I poured my heart out to them. Uh, we talked about it, we hugged, we cried, and we prayed. And uh, we agreed that uh, the best uh, uh, decision I could do right now is to drop out of college and uh, work on my mental health. So uh, as Elder Rubin said, uh, I was stu I'm studying in CIIT. Uh, not anymore. I dropped out of college. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a dropout right now. But, uh, but fortunately, um, I'm now seeing a therapist. I'm back to square one. I felt so lost, but thankfully the love and support I received from um, my parents, my relatives, and my friends uh, brought me back up. I started uh, finding alternatives right now recently. I started revisiting connections I had. I'm now in contact with um, this uh, online community that's um, located in Los Angeles. I'm attending master classes. Um, and webinars on like workshops. I'm taking a personal development course right now. Um, and I'm also um, making connections um, through uh, music with my friends from all around the world, from, from Australia, from the United States, from Canada. And, um, but most importantly, right now, I gave God the steering wheel. Amen. Um, and brothers and sisters in Christ, it is so relieving giving God back that's doing it. It's so, it feels so good um, putting God back in charge. Um, all the burdens, all the stresses are onto him. He is now uh, leading me right now. Um, uh, 
you know, uh, a good movie, I, 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 I read that a good movie thriller is when uh, you don't know where the story is going. Uh, when you don't know if the character is going to survive or make it out of the situation, you are unsure whether um, you'll get the good ending or the bad ending. I remember, um, yeah, as I said, one of my favorite activities to do uh, with my dad is binge watch movies. And sometimes we've seen some terrible movies with terrible endings. And uh, I remember my dad would go, Ano ba yan? Ang pangit yung ending yun. Bakit? Uh, the direct translation is, oh, what an ugly ending. Oh, that's a terrible movie. And, and sometimes we, we feel like that. Sometimes we feel like our life is a movie and that it's going to end terribly. We're, we find ourselves in these moments where we feel stuck and lost and there's nothing we could do. Sometimes you think that it's the end, that it's, in the, it's the end of the world. But with God, it's, there's a 100% guarantee that the ending will always be good. Um, there's a verse right here um, in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. It says, the heart of the man plans his way but the Lord establishes his steps. We, make, we may make plans, and sometimes they may fail. We may think that we got it covered. We may think that we are the directors of our life, but we forget that it's God who's in charge. He is the one in control of our narrative. You know, we all have this saying that goes, God is good all the time. And... um. And yes, indeed, we have a good God. And I just want to break down this logic, okay? We have a God that is all good. Everything he does, everything he touches is perfection. And what he is um, touching right now is our lives and our paths. So that means our lives will eventually be good. That's what he has planned for us. What God has planned for us is paradise. What uh, God has planned for us is a good ending. Um, here's another classic verse um, that we all memorized uh, since we were kids and we teach our kids and little children. And um, th there are many songs um, with these lyrics and this verse. It's found in Proverbs 3, verse 5 to 6. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. He will direct your paths. And sometimes uh, we go through these paths and we stumble upon roadblocks. We stumble upon uh, debris and sharp pebbles, and we think that it's a dead end, and that's all we're leading to. But we sometimes forget that God is the one leading the way, and that's what we should always remember. Um, yes, if you allow God to be your director, you'll always get the good ending. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we should follow his direction. I don't know what God's plan for me right now. I can't predict it. Um, and... I'm building myself right back up with his blessing and according to his will. But sometimes I might fail again. Sometimes uh, I, I'll never know. Maybe even worse things may come to my life. Maybe I'll struggle again. But this time, I'm 100% confident that God's got it handled. Don't spend another minute in the pig pen. Don't spend another minute on your knees in front of I defeated. Do not waste your failures by failing to learn from them because God has not forgotten you. You never know what good awaits you. So back to Scott Norwood. He missed the kick. He failed his city. He's embarrassed the media, the sports uh, news were milking out his name. Um, calling him a failure, um, reminding him every day that he missed that kick. He walked out of the football field with his head down, and indeed, that missed kick did haunt him. He didn't feel peace at all. He couldn't sleep. Every page of a newspaper, every news story, everything that he hears from 
or is reminding him of his failure. He, he was still upset when he returned, when his team returned to Buffalo. But in spite of the loss, the city of Buffalo hosted an event to honor the team. And the turnout was huge. Um, between 25 and 30,000 people, which, is, which I find very interesting because um, uh, Joshua sent 30,000 people back to I. And uh, 30,000 people were here in this parade honoring the Buffalo Bills, his team. And Scott was there. Scott was in st on stage with his teammates, but he was embarrassed. He tried to linger. He tried to hide behind the crowd. He couldn't even look at their faces. He felt like a total failure. But in the middle of a civic leader's speech during that parade, a chant in the crowd began. The crowd, the fans, they were going, we want Scott, we want Scott, we want Scott. It grew louder. We want Scott, we want Scott, we want Scott. But Scott still hid behind them. He, he, he wasn't sure why the fans were calling him. Maybe he thought they were going to, you know, uh, have a riot or something. But the chant grew louder that the speaker had to stop, and Scott's teammates pushed him in front of the platform, and when the fans saw him, as you can see here, they gave him a rousing ovation. They applauded and cheered. He missed the kick, but they made sure he knew that he was still a part of their community. We got others cheering on us too. In the Bible, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Angels in heaven, the Holy Spirit, God, is whispering to us. They are chanting our names. They're saying, keep going. Don't quit. It's worth it. Try again. Put every weight, of, weight aside. That failure, that failed grade, that mistake you made, that's nothing. Continue on. Do it with God on your side. Try again. Do it God's way. We may have missed goals from time to time, but we're always a part of God's team. Amen? No failure is fatal. No failure is fatal. These are the three key things I want us to take away. No failure is fatal. Even if we make a mistake, um, all we have to do is rise up and go to our Father. That's the only thing you could do. You can't sulk in it. You can't let the failure and the guilt consume you. It's nothing because God has a plan for you. And that leads to our second point that I would like us to remember. Do it God's way. If you failed the first time, do it again. Maybe try to break it down. Maybe you're not. Maybe it's not God's plan for you. Maybe that's not what God intended. And maybe try to do it His way. Let God be your director, and you will get your good ending. Third, God is cheering you on. Um, as I said, I have generalized anxiety disorder. So sometimes um, one of the symptoms is I will get anxiety attacks or feel a looming sense of uh, insecurity and fear. But with this in mind, knowing that God is 100% behind my back and he's cheering me on to succeed, that comforts me so much. And I want you guys to remember that too whenever you're feeling down, whenever you feel like you can't go on. God is there by your side, whispering to your ear. The Holy Spirit is behind your back, um, motivating you to carry on and to follow um, and run through the path that God has directed for you. And if we keep these three things in mind, if we focus on it, uh, if we remember not to, uh, not to entertain the negativity, if we remember to uh, do it God's way always and remember that he's always there no matter what, uh, we will get our good ending. We will join him in his heavenly kingdom in heaven and receive our good ending in paradise with him forever. And that's what he has promised 
us and that's what he's going to fulfill. Um. Thank you.